Welcome to Leadership in Lockdown, our uh, video series talking to people from across higher education and early talent about how they're handling um, leadership uh, within the current kind of uh, coronavirus crisis and challenge uh, we all find ourselves uh, working in. Um, it's obviously a challenging time for everyone and uh, leaders in all sorts of organisations are facing challenges in their individual uh, organisations but also in their sectors and, and, and um, whilst also uh, balancing professional, personal uh, life as well. So uh, we're hoping to just gather insights and ideas from people around uh, the sector and um, today we're really delighted to welcome uh, Chris Millwood who's the um, Director of Fair Access and Participation at the Office for Students uh, to join us. Thanks for, for joining us Chris. How are you doing? Are you well? I'm good thanks. Yeah. Excellent. Um, so I uh, wanted to just chat to you obviously today a bit about, uh, about leadership uh, in this kind of environment. Uh, what have you what have you found to be the maybe the biggest challenges of leadership uh, in this kind of new world, this sort of new normal? Okay. Um, well, at one level, we've had to, as um, the regulator of higher education, had to make some difficult decisions about um, our regulation of universities and colleges. We've had to change our expectations of universities and colleges, really boil that down to the most important issues in this environment, like protecting students, maintaining quality and standards, uh, financial health of universities. So, so we've actually had to make some very difficult decisions um, uh, quickly. Yeah. And we've had to communicate that fairly clearly and carefully so that everybody understands them. Um, because it will affect behaviour out in the sector and, 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 and ultimately the the experience uh, for students. We've also had to make those decisions whilst navigating other parties with an interest, particularly government. Mm. So uh, the big leadership challenge initially for us was uh, rapidly making really important decisions, um, making sure that people who needed to know were involved in that, uh, and then communicating it really clearly to the sector. So, yeah. so, so that's a kind of more outward facing challenge. I think a, a, a more internal challenge, and I'm sure other people will say this, is uh, you know all all of the ways of of making decisions and engaging with staff that you're used to are not happening now. So no. so um, uh, briefing our staff, getting their views, um, asking them to do work, asking them to change their work quite fundamentally, all of that is having to happen. Um, uh, or online essentially rather than face to face and and you just don't have the benefit of uh, the human contact the kind of little insights you get from face to face contact so in in many ways they're all more difficult conversations to have yeah how, how would you say you've kind of adapted to deal with those kind of those kind of different things is the is the things you've learned along the way over the last six eight weeks i guess to to kind of uh, develop that both yeah. Um, so we, so we, uh, so so again, let me pick up the two themes. You know, the the big decisions we had to take, and then the the, the internal engagement with staff. On the first one, uh, we as a management team, from the outset, and really for the first two or three weeks of the pandemic uh, and the lockdown, uh, met every morning for an hour. So so we all got together eight thirty to nine thirty every morning. That started with a you know, review of the, the, the landscape, what's coming out of the government briefings, what are we picking up from the sector and from students. Mm. And, and then quite quickly we structured our work during the coronavirus into a series of work streams which we reviewed every day. Say, so, okay, what are we trying to achieve with this? What's happening on it? So, so we very quickly set up a structure for us to meet in a, in a group um, identify the things we need to do, um, make decisions and progress all of that. And yeah. then we also, within our own parts of the organisation, worked out how we were going to then translate those central management meetings into action out in our areas, making sure people were properly briefed. So, so I think that, that very rapid restructuring of our meeting cycle, decision making processes, communication processes uh, was really key. Um, I think on the day-to-day -day level, working with staff and indeed colleagues in government and in the sector, um, there is just an overhead with having to work harder to communicate. Yeah. So, 
So I am doing a lot of Teams calls, yeah. both one to one with groups of staff, probably more than I would, you know, more, more uh, frequent structured meetings and contact than I would do normally, because mm -hmm. that's the way of keeping in touch. Um, so yeah. so it's, a, it's a different way of working. Yeah, I think we've picked up a lot of people almost missing the water cooler, the kind of informal corridor conversations, and then trying to kind of, it almost feels like you're overstructuring that. that and if you arrange a Teams meeting just to have an yeah. informal chat, but somehow you've got to pick these things up, haven't you, along, along, along the way? Yeah, um, and I think, I think, you know, in our kind of sector and our kind of organisations, you know, a number of people rely on informal intelligence. Mm, absolutely. Um, you know, picked up in the margins of meetings and gatherings and that's just not happening so no. you've got to work harder to stay in touch i think you, you you really do that's i think that's that's really important um i guess if you look um more externally are there, are there, are there kind of examples of leadership you've seen in either public life or or either or perhaps around you in your team or things that you think actually that's that's been really positive how they've done it. or maybe the other maybe the other side of the coin things that you think actually uh that, that's really not how you should be communicating in this kind of time um I, I think I have the seen um I, I think we've been careful about what issues we try to tackle in the short term. Mm. Um, for example, in relation to performance management, um, and how we tackle them. Um and I uh and I'm not sure that and I've seen some kind of weak examples of how that's being dealt with yeah. uh, in the current situation. I, I guess in terms of, you know, you, you're splitting your time between a whole bunch of things. You're having those regular meetings. You're trying to keep in touch, yeah, build intelligence, but also kind of manage really clear comms in a very complex sector. Um, how are you splitting your time between thinking about the kind of maybe the immediate, um, you know, burning platforms that are there and the kind of thinking about, okay, what does 2021 look like in this environment and, and that more future scoping bit? Yeah. Um, so we have quite deliberately structured our work into what we call a kind of red and amber uh, and black work strands. Um, so red is the immediate work we're doing to manage the coronavirus situation, um, engagement with the sector, with government, with students um, on, on all of that, structured into a number of work streams that we know are the most important. And we are uh, putting all of our staff resource onto that work, all the staff resource that's needed for that work yeah. um, and reprioritizing that. We know also that there are, you know, longer term goals we still want to pursue. Um, the, and that relates both to kind of underpinning work that we do for the sector. For example, we, you know, produce data and gather data and produce analysis on issues, we're doing a lot of work to improve evaluation in my area, for example. Um, uh, the area the work that I'm doing with universities is about you know, five year plans to shift equality in relation to access and participation. So we still wanna get yeah. back to that when we can. So we're still where we've got the staff resource, um, putting time into those areas where we call them amber areas um, and, and it's quite important that we make staff feel that they're just as important, you know, yeah. that it's important that we continue with that longer running uh, work. There are also then inevitably having put more staff resource into the red areas, yeah. um, activities we, we're now labelling black, we just can't do at the moment. Um, and those we're just, um, uh, we're putting on pause for a minute. I think, I think one of the interesting things is, and this may come on something you're going to talk about is is we we're not assuming that you know as we fade out of this everything will be the same we'll just go back to where we were um the nations you know the government policy in some areas will be quite different i suspect because we'll be looking at national recovery yeah. and of course a whole set of economic issues as public service issues um, that will influence what happens and we won't be immune from that so part of our work at the moment is about starting to have some foresight about what might the world look like in the autumn and what might our role be and how should we regulate 
in that yes. environment rather than just assume it's you know switching on and switching off and back on again yeah i think that's really interesting isn't it this kind of wrestling between the idea of i think some people are just almost hoping that we will at some point just go back to totally as it was before but actually yeah. the reality around that is unlikely and and therefore what does this kind of new new stage look like um i guess what do you see as the um uh thinking in that kind of mid to long term bracket what do you see as the particular challenges but maybe also the opportunities for higher education uh, in, in particular i guess in, in in that kind of mid to long term yeah now, now in this environment okay um so i i think let, let me say something first about the character of english higher education so you know i think we're really fortunate in this country that we have universities that have uh, you know some of the brightest students and staff from all around the world um and uh i think of course they're important financially to universities and that's a big source of discussion at the moment but actually they they're important to the culture of universities yeah. and, and and benefit both when they're here and when they go back to their home countries uh so uh it, i i really want us to get back to whatever happens in the next year about about international student participation in this country we really must get back to that um, yes. you know international open um a magnet of higher education that we've got in 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 this country so so yes. i don't want that, that to change but it, equally universities will have to think about how they can make that work given whatever constraints there are on mobility and indeed a different appetite from people in different countries to come 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 here or leave their own country so 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 i think there's a set of issues about how we uh, remain a global higher education sector we continue to get the best minds in the world uh, studying here and working here and helping our teaching and research effort but yeah. do it in a way that 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 you know reflects the world that we'll be in at, the, at that point and perhaps the different attitudes in in different countries um uh, i think i think alongside that um, clearly, what we've seen during this period is a terrific spirit of partnership locally and nationally. So we are seeing, and it's you know, being reported to me, universities, further education colleges, NHS trusts, local authorities, you know, anchor businesses in areas working really closely together um, to get through this as part of the local resilience effort. And I'm interested in how that partnership particularly in local areas, can help us in the next phase. Mm. So in terms of, you know, the training that will be needed um, for people, uh, you know, people might need to change work. We might have to expect to have more adults engaging in higher education and further education and mm. training. Um, how we get the economy going as well. How we ensure good jobs for graduates as they're flowing Absolutely. through the system this year. So those partnerships are going to be really key, and keeping those partnerships going, not just as a one-off response to this, I think will be um, important. Um, I think um, I, I mean two other areas that are part of my immediate remit and my work. On the one hand, you know I'm quite closely involved in health and medical education. And there was already a big push to expand the number of nurses and potentially more doctors as well for the health service. Um, and I hope that we can ride the back of this and the great public support for the health service to encourage more people to work in those sectors and indeed to, to help it become even more a sector that people want to work in and thrive in. Um, the other issue to highlight is it's pretty widely uh, thought and there's good evidence about this already that um, you know some of the inequalities that we see in relation to education um, at all stages of the educational cycle from early years through to primary and secondary and entire education um, they could be compounded during all of this yeah we're seeing inequality of um, cases um, of coronavirus we're seeing inequality in relation to the degree to which students in schools are accessing resources um, uh, and getting support. Um, we know that you know the students who might most need to work while they study because of because they come from low-income families and higher education are, are, are not having 
jobs at the moment so there's hardship issues with all of that um i think there's good widespread recognition of that and we will need to work to ensure that that doesn't make inequality worse at the yeah. end of this um so that the recognition turns into tangible action over the coming years and the progress we've actually been making on reducing inequality we we get back to we get back to to to, to improving the situation yeah, absolutely. No, I think that's vital. Like you say, it's, some of those things feel like they've been entrenched, don't they, by this kind of situation. Uh, it's going to be important to almost like d double down in the effort in, in those areas, whether social mobility or, or, or whatever. So, great. Okay, well, we're just, uh, I guess, drawing to a close, but, but well, there's obviously positives and negatives in this whole situation. I guess, what are the positive things that you hope will stick around um, and maybe become lasting changes uh, in, in our work and, and lives? In, in, not just necessarily in the sector, but generally? Um, I think the spirit of partnership, um, the willingness to be practical and change and, 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 and be positive about solving problems during this period, I hope we'll continue with, and that applies to people working with me in my organisation, but of course, in the, of course, in the wider world, the positive attitude towards um, supporting the most disadvantaged in society, um, uh, I hope we'll be able to stick with that and, and seriously address it. The positive attitude towards public services, particularly healthcare, you know, those are going to be really important into the future. Um, we are going to need uh, plans locally and nationally to recover from this, yeah. um, given what we're seeing about the potential impact on jobs and the economy, for example. And that will mean that we can't just see, you know, people providing education people employing people, private and public sectors as all separate parties, they're going to no. need to work together uh, to be able to address this. Yeah, absolutely, that, that kind of wider ecosystem sense. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, can I just return to one of your previous questions? So, yeah, so by all means, yeah. You asked me what I thought was had been good during all this, and um, I think the BBC News has been really good. Um, so, so yeah. um, I've been really struck by how the the BBC News has been able to, you know, present uh, you know, really difficult and upsetting facts, which we all need to know about, um, explain some of the complexities well, um, yeah. with, with people who understand the detail but are translating it well, but also make it human. So there are just some wonderful case studies I've seen on the 10 o'clock news almost every night whether it's people working in hospitals, people working in care homes, yeah. people caring in their own homes, that just turn, you know, the statistics into real life experiences, which is just so, just so important. So I've been hugely impressed by that. The, the other thing is, is they have tried also to reflect, not in a kind of sentimental or cliched way, um, how we are together responding positively to this through the use yeah. of music, through the use of films of us on our doorsteps on Thursday night, etc. So, so I think it has been a period in which you know public broadcasting, and of course, I'm many other people have said this as well. But but public broadcasting has been needed, and and I think has done well. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I think, um, like you say, everything from things like those montage songs or, or through to through to just those kind of yeah, you know, that advert they've got around moments saying you know one day we'll be all talking about more positive things together you know it's it's actually yeah. kind of it's actually quite a powerful message isn't it that that, that this will end and that, that you know even though it feels pretty pretty tough for everybody right now so yeah that's, that's a real balance to strike isn't it yeah okay well um thank you so much chris we really thank value you. your time and and i know you've got a lot on so appreciate you making time for this um thanks to those of you who've watched this i hope you found it useful and insightful um, uh, keep an eye out for future uh, leadership in lockdown sessions and um, stay healthy and we'll hopefully see you again. Thanks. <laughs>